Well, good morning again. It's been a little while uh, since I've been in this position, and we do have some newer folks with us these days. Praise God. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is David Goliford. I am what you might consider a lay minister, uh, which means I do most of my preaching and teaching laying down. <laughs> oh, wow. Didn't think that would get laughs. All right. Uh, no, it just means I, I'm not a vocational minister at this point. I'm not on staff here at Living Word, so I can pretty much say whatever I want to say uh, with no direct consequences. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, I, Pastor Scott's been very gracious to me, giving me opportunities, uh, several opportunities over the last few years. Since I've come back from Bible school, I'm very thankful to him for that. He is, even though he's not here, he is ultimately responsible for what takes place in this pulpit. So I appreciate his act of trust in, in letting me properly steward these moments, and I am continue to be thankful to you as my church family for allowing me to develop right in front of you. I'm, I'm far from the polished speaker that our senior pastor is, and I don't have a library of sermons to pull from when I have these opportunities. But uh, what I can do, just as well as anyone else, is be obedient. So that's my uh, pledge to you. Every time I have these opportunities, I'll be obedient to uh, do and say whatever the Lord is leading me to do and say to the best of my ability. So today, we're going to look at an aspect of the vision that God has given Living Word uh, for this season. And if you've been here for any longer than a week, maybe two, you've heard this vision statement. And if you're here for the very first time, you could see this vision statement right now because it's posted on these walls below the screens. It is live the gospel, preach the gospel. We say it all the time. Here. And uh, this past summer, during the church life and ministry class that Pastor Scott led many of us through, uh, he expounded on that a little bit. And he said that the vision he believes the Lord has given him for living word during this season is that we be a body of believers who has a handle on the message of the gospel to such a degree that we can and do confidently share it with others. That's, I don't know if he said it exactly that way. That's kind of my paraphrase. But I believe that lines up with what we see in Ephesians 4, that Jesus gave the, the ministry gifts, the, the prophets, apostles, pastors, evangelists, teachers, to the church for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So part of what we do is we gather here every Sunday uh, is that equipping, right? So if it boils down to living the gospel and preaching the gospel, if that's what we're supposed to do as a, as a body here, I think the preaching part is fairly self-explanatory. We need to be sharing the gospel with our words uh, to those around us, right? But the living the gospel, what, what does that look like? Um, to live the, the good news of Jesus, what does that actually look like? It means we need to live out what we believe to those around us, which sounds like a good answer, but what, is that, what does that actually mean? What does it mean to live what we believe? Does it mean to to take a stance against the sin that the world around us so readily accepts and celebrates? Sure. It doesn't mean to stand out, to live a life of holiness that separates us from the world around us. Sure. But it also means living the abundant life that Jesus came to give us, according to John 10.10. 10. It's not good that we blend in with the world around us when it comes to these issues of sin and, and holiness, but it's also not good that we blend in with those around us that our enemy is stealing from and killing and destroying when we've been giving, given the very life of God to live here on this earth, right? As believers, we should stand out. We believers should be the best in every field. We should be the best students and athletes and actors and plumbers and doctors and everything else, all for the glory of God. That's living the gospel, putting Jesus on display for those who are in our spheres of influence. So, how do we actually obtain this abundant life? How do we effectively live the gospel? The title of my message this morning is Possessing the Promises of God. And I believe it goes right in line with what Pastor Scott has been teaching over the last several weeks and months about faith. And uh, if you have a Bible this morning, we're going to be taking a, a journey through the beginning of the book of Joshua. You can make your way there. And what we're going to do is look through the first several chapters for principles of possessing the promises of God and, and walking in his abundant life. And we're going to spend the bulk of our time, we're going to look at other verses, but I would recommend if you 
are following along in a physical Bible, just stay in Joshua. That's where we'll be for the most part. And, uh, but I want to lay kind of a, a New Testament foundation first. I feel like if we, if we read the Old Testament without the New Testament lens of Jesus, we potentially could get off track a little bit. So we're going to start with a couple of New Testament verses. The first one will be in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. And it says, For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. The receiving God's promises requires us to do his will. There's a, there's a man side to this, right? Doing his will requires endurance, according to this verse. God has given us so many great and precious promises throughout his word. And they don't just, they're, they're available to us, but they don't just fall into our laps. There's something required of us in order to receive the promises of God. Uh, in honor of Illinois' win last night on the football field, I'll make a, a football analogy, uh, and today is the first full Sunday slate of NFL games. Woo! All right. A few of you excited. Not the Bears fans. Um, so in football, a, a receiver, if that's, that's our position in, in uh Christianity, God is the giver, the passer, whatever. But a receiver in football can't just stand there in the middle of the field, have a ball thrown to him and expect to catch it, right? He's got to use his eyes, he's got to use his hands, his body in order to actually receive. So when God throws us a Hail Mary, <laughs> too far. But when he makes a promise, there's still a receiving that has to take place on our end. Another New Testament verse. This is also from the book of Hebrews, uh, which our pastor believes was written by the Apostle Paul. No comment. He might be right. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. They say this, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So our receiving the promises of God isn't automatic. It takes faith. It takes patience. It requires something of us. And someone might ask, well, why, why does God make promises and then not just give us the fulfillment of these things? And Pastor Scott asked that last week, I believe, and, and answered it uh, by reminding us that we still have the world, the flesh, the devil to contend with in this life. But from God's perspective, why, why does he not just make the promise and then give us the fulfillment of it? And this, this answer may seem a little more trite, but I believe it's also true. God's not just concerned about the outcome for us. He's, he's concerned about the journey that we're on. He wants us to learn things throughout the process between here and the fulfillment of the promise. That's why he set it up this way. Every spiritual principle, every promise that God has made has a God side and a man side. God's side is to proclaim the promise, which he's already done for all of his promises. Our side is to enact it or to possess it. So what's the very first promise that we as believers took a hold of in our, in our walk of faith? It was the promise of salvation, right? So how did we receive that? Ephesians tells us it was by grace through faith. So God's side was grace. Our side is faith. I've heard it said like this, God's, uh, the grace is the hand of God that gives, and faith is the hand of man that takes. So it's a, a joint effort there. God has made salvation available to everyone, but the only ones who will receive it are those who do so by faith, through the belief in your heart and confession of the mouth, as according to Romans 10, 9, and 10. So the same is true of all of God's promises and principles. They are given by God, by grace, received by us, by faith. Uh, this is, I hesitate to do this because it's a, an illustration that's been used before, but I think it's effective. Um, so think of your, your favorite place to eat. Uh, not Chick-fil-A, they're closed today, you're just going to be setting yourself up for failure there. Think of a different place, your favorite place to eat, then think of your favorite meal to get at that place. I am personally right now thinking of a deep dish pepperoni pizza from Papa Dell's Pizza Factory, Champaign, Illinois. Glorious. But that favorite meal that you're thinking of represents the promises of God, okay? So let's say I'm the owner of whatever restaurant you're thinking of, and I come up to you and I say, 
I would like you to come to my place, get your favorite meal, and I'm going to give you a gift card that will allow you to get whatever you want. So the gift card, I, I have the promises, I have the food that you're wanting, and it's going to take something on your end to obtain it, and I'm giving you the means to do that as well. The gift card represents our faith. So you have the means to get the promises of God by use of your faith. So what all is involved in that role of us, uh, for us, this idea of utilizing our faith or enacting the promises of God? What does that actually look like? That's what we're going to be looking at today, a few principles uh, throughout the beginning of the book of Joshua. And before we get there, uh, just a little bit of a historical backdrop for this. Um, Joshua is the first book after the law, the first five books of the Bible, where uh, a large portion of this is following uh, the story of the nation of Israel, but it really begins with Abram and the initial promise that God gives concerning the promised land, the land of Canaan, is given to Abram way back in Genesis 12, and it's repeated to him over and over. It's reiterated to his son Isaac, to his son Jacob, to his son Joseph, and we skip ahead to Exodus and the, the rest of the law. It's repeated over and over to Moses, to the children of Israel as a whole, and to Joshua. So that's where we're at. We are generations, centuries, really, from God's initial promise to Abram. And that's where we're at with Joseph as we look at uh, key principles in possessing the promises of God. We're going to go through five of these today. Uh, it was six until about midday yesterday when I realized this was way too long. So we're going to do five, and then we're going to give application for each of these uh, as we go through. So to start, number one, we're going to look at the principle of preparation. Number one is preparation. And if you're in Joshua, we're starting in chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses 10 and 11 for this. Joshua 1, 10. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the camp, and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves, for within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Notice the language at the end there, uh, to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. So this perfectly describes what I was just talking about. Uh, God was doing the giving of the land, but there was still a possessing that had to take place, right? So step one in this possessing uh, for Israel here was preparation. They had to prepare some things. And preparation takes faith. Uh, we'll talk more about faith uh, a little bit later on when we read about Israel actually crossing the Jordan. But even in the preparing of provisions, Israel had to do so with the belief that they would actually be crossing over. We won't look at Noah's story, but he's another example of faith taking on the form of preparation. Hebrews 11 tells us that by faith, Noah prepared an ark. If he didn't believe what God had said about the flood, he wouldn't have felt the need to prepare. Preparation uh, is a signal to God that says, I believe what you said. So I want you to be thinking of, not just in this point, but as we go through the message, be thinking of something that, um, maybe a promise from God that you've been waiting on for a while, um, something either from his word or something he's spoken to you. Uh, just be thinking about that. And in regards to this principle of preparation, ask yourself, uh, are you ready? If, if God were to fulfill that promise that you've been waiting on today, would you be ready for it? Uh, and if not, what are the steps that you can take to be ready, to prepare? Um, Israel's promise was that they would possess the land of Canaan, and in order to get there, they needed to prepare. I've Personally, I've had opportunities to do this in my own life, um, in August of 2017, I shared some of this with uh, the small group that I'm in a few weeks ago. Um, in August of 2017, early August, I was in the midst of this 40-day fast of sorts and was just seeking the Lord on some things. And uh, very clearly, one morning, not audibly, but I heard uh, the Lord tell me that it was time to go to Ramah, which is the Bible school I went to in Oklahoma. And in the back of my mind, I, I'm a very, most of you know, I'm a very scheduled, routine person. I like to plan. I like to know things ahead of time. And 
I know in the back of my mind when he tells me this, I'm like, Rama starts like right after Labor Day. And I'm, this is early August, so I'm like, hmm. There's a little bit of panic mode that sets in. I'm like, God, do you mean this year? And he said no. And he told me I would need a year to prepare practically and spiritually. So that's what I did for that whole year. I, I did things, practical things to prepare for that next step. I uh, applied to the school. I applied for student housing, got set up with a roommate, figured out the job situation. I told people, got the referrals and references that I needed and all that stuff. And I was spending that entire year getting closer to God and my relationship with him as well. And unlike the accounts in the Bible where we know the end of the story, um, sorry, like the accounts in the Bible where we know the end, I knew that this had a timed end to it. I knew when I would be going to school. But I still spent that time preparing. And all of that preparation set me up to step into that season in the best possible state. The more prepared you are, the more enjoyable the end result. Uh, when I come here on the Sunday mornings that I am playing the drums, if I come in here not knowing my stuff, I haven't practiced at all, I just kind of think, yeah, I know these songs well enough, I'm not prepared, and therefore I'm going to be thinking about what I'm doing the entire time that we're worshiping. I'm going to be thinking about doing the right things at the right time, not messing up. If I come in prepared, well prepared, practiced up, prayed up, worshiped up, I'll be able to focus on him during the time of worship, which is as it should be, right? The more prepared you are, the more enjoyable the end result. And again, since, since football's back, I'll just go ahead and say this. This has nothing to do with my message. But preparation is what makes Peyton Manning the best quarterback of all time. Right? That's right. Huh? Okay, get thee behind me. He's my favorite quarterback of all time. How about that? All right, so application for this principle of preparation. Um, what does this look like? Uh, the application here, I would just say answer that question that I asked before. If, if you don't feel like, if there's some parts of your life that aren't quite ready for the fulfillment of the promise you're waiting on, take the steps necessary to get there. Do the little things, or in Noah's case, the big things. Whatever it is God's asking you to do, don't ignore the small promptings, right? Uh, he wants to lead us to the fulfillment, and he also wants to lead us in our preparation as we get there. Uh, God gave me a little over a year warning about Ramah. Joshua uh, gave Israel three days to prepare provisions. Whatever amount of time you have, you may not know what that is, but use it wisely. Use the time wisely between the promise and the fulfillment. You may be sitting on a promise from God and you don't know when the manifestation is going to come. And he may be asking you to do things that seem like they have nothing to do with the promise you're waiting on, but obey anyway. Don't ignore the small promptings. I think it's easy to get distracted by the big picture and ignore where we're at here and now. But... Uh, Every puzzle is put together one piece at a time. So just take the step that's in front of you, whatever he's asking you to do. Principle number two this morning is the principle of remembrance. First one was preparation. Now we're moving, we're moving on to remembrance. These aren't linear. They're just kind of how they show up uh, in this story that we're following in Joshua. And we'll continue in chapter one, going now to verse 13. This is Joshua speaking, and he says, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is giving you rest and is giving you this land. Now, in context, Joshua is saying this to the two and a half tribes who had decided to settle on the east side of the Jordan. Uh, those two and a half, Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh, under Moses' leadership and with God's approval, they had decided to settle some land on the east side before crossing over, and the other nine and a half helped them do this. So this reminder here from Joshua, he's telling them, okay, we helped you, now you need to help us. But it's not just a reminder of what they agreed to do, but it's a reminder of what God had said to them, that they would indeed possess the land. It is vital in our lives that we keep God's promises before us. His word is truth. When we're 
when we're facing a lie or a battle or a difficult situation, we have to remind ourselves of his truth. God has given us so many instances in Scripture that tell us who he is and tell us who we are in him. And in fact, there's a, a mini book that's pretty popular around here by Brother Kenneth E. Hagan called In Him. It's a super short book, takes probably 15 minutes to go through, but towards the end, there's over 200 references uh, of scriptures of who we are in Christ. And if it's been a while since you've done like a self-review in that area of who you are in Christ, I encourage you to pick up a copy of that and just go through it, go through those scriptures, find out what God has said about who you are, right? Who has never read in him? Who's never, does anybody not have that, not have a copy of that? Well, I wanted to feel like Oprah this morning. So I bought five of these on Amazon. But it's going to take faith for you to get these. So whoever wants these, they're up here. Wow, nobody. No, it's going to take faith. It's going to take some action. There we go. Way to go. You get an in him, and you get an in him. All right, that's fine. And if uh, you didn't want to use your faith this morning, you can use your $2 and get your own on Amazon. (laughs) Remembering God's promises and possessing God's promises go hand in hand. Uh, Let's look at a a passage in the book of James real quick that shows us this. James chapter 1. We're going to read 22 through 25. James says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So those who hear only are forgetful, but those who hear and do uh, safeguard themselves against forgetting. And if you ever feel like, man, I just, I have a hard time remembering uh, God's word, let me remind you of this verse. Uh, In John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus says this, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So it's our responsibility to put the word in us, and it's the Holy Spirit's responsibility to bring it back to us, right? So what's the application here for this principle of remembrance? Uh, It's twofold today, and and I think doing the first one inadvertently helps us do the second one. So the first part, uh, I think one of the most simple and effective ways to keep the promises of God before us is to speak them out. And that's something Pastor Scott has been talking about recently, speaking out what is in you. And this is naturally going to happen. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So put the word in you and let the word come out of you. Uh, The numbers here uh, may vary based on where you're looking, but it's generally believed that we remember about 10% of what we read, uh, 20% of what we hear, but 70% of what we say. So... uh, Going back to James, I, I, don't, I don't want to be a forgetful hearer and forget about 80% of what I hear, but I would rather be a remembering doer. So part of that is saying these promises of God. And then the second part of that, uh, which I think will just be a natural outflow of the first, is put Scripture to memory. As you're speaking them out, this will happen naturally, but this is something I've recently been prompted to be more proactive in, uh, an area of my life is... Bible memorization. I would encourage you in that same vein as well. You know, the psalmist said that he would hide God's word in his heart that he might not sin against him. And, you know, some of us might think, yeah, it's, it's hard to memorize things, and I, I don't have time for that, but how many songs do you know all the lyrics to? And that's, for the most part, that's not something we purposely do, it just happens by way of exposure. We hear something over and over, and then all of a sudden we, we know all of it. But, you know, the psalmist didn't say that I'll hide Beyonce's words in my heart that I might not say. No, it's God's words. And I'm pointing the finger at myself as well, not with Beyonce. But uh, 
Uh, when I was younger, I used to have whole episodes of shows completely memorized. Uh, what, what if I, you remember this? Okay. What if, I, <laughs> what if I used that time to memorize scripture instead? I could probably stand here and quote to you 80 to 90% of the Incredibles movie. What good is that doing me? Mm. No. Anyway. So expose yourself more to the Word. We can be doing this, you know, in our day and age. We can be listening to the Word. I'm not saying you can never listen to music, but we can be listening to the Word and getting that in us. There's a couple other people in here who could quote that with me, but I won't point you out. So let's move on to the third principle. Uh, this is the principle of faith. And this is mainly what we've been talking about here at Living Word for the last couple of months is faith. Now, in the narrative of Joshua, we're coming to the point where the Jordan River was crossed. This is the big, this is what everything's been leading up to, right? Took some pretty intense steps of faith. We'll read about this in Joshua 3, and we're going to read verses 14 through 17. So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as those who bore the ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zeraton. So the waters that went down into the Sea of the Arabah, the Salt Sea, failed and were cut off, and the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Then the priests who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground, in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. So remember, one of the verses we started with, Hebrews 10.36, for you have need of endurance that you, after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. The promised land uh, for Israel here, the promised land was on the other side of the Jordan, and they weren't about to teleport from one side to the other, although I would have enjoyed reading that. Um, and they, weren't, they didn't have a bridge that they could take over. That would have been nice, but a bridge wouldn't have required faith. The, the steps that God has for us to take require faith. That's how we please him. That's how the just are called to live. God had taken the previous generation that came out of Egypt across the Red Sea by way of Moses and his staff parting the waters. This generation had more required of them because that's how God operates, right? Right? They had to actually step into the water before it would part. Each step on dry ground was an opportunity for them to be overtaken by the thought of, oh my gosh, is this water going to come back and kill us all? But each step on dry ground was a step of faith. And the entire nation of Israel made it across. And this wasn't the only time that God would ask Israel to do something kind of ridiculous. Uh, we're not going to read about it today, but probably the most famous account in the book of Joshua is the story of Jericho, and God instructs them to do something that is maybe a bit counterintuitive, uh, rather than, you know, go with an army ready for battle, they're marching around the city and shouting. Seems a little, little ridiculous, but they followed through and they gained the victory there as well. So what else could this look like in our lives? I I think sometimes we read, like Pastor Scott did last week, most of or not, if not all of uh, Hebrews 11 that he read last week. I think we read those accounts and we just think, wow, look at all the big things that these people did uh, by faith. And they're real accounts. Uh, I believe them wholeheartedly. But I'm not facing a river that I have to cross. I'm not being threatened by a king who's going to throw me in a furnace if I don't bow down to his image, right? There's these things that seem so up here, and my life, I'm not facing those things. So I want to, again, not that those things aren't real, but I want to bring this down a little bit, um, maybe to the level where more of us might be. So here's what faith is looking like in my life right now, and I'm not going to go into detail for the sake of time, uh, but at the beginning of this summer, um, at the Lord's prompting, I made a very difficult decision that from the outside looking in, if people were to view my life and see this decision before me, they would maybe 
encouraged me to go the other way. That's, that's probably what would have made more sense to most people. But God directed me elsewhere. And that was a, a difficult decision. It was one of submission. Uh, and it was one of faith. Not a, not a huge thing. I didn't, I didn't cross a river. I didn't, you know, slay a giant or anything. It was just a little decision. Difficult, like I said, but I did so by faith. And in the months since, there have been these, these little instructions from God uh, here and there. Just uh, add this to your routine or um, fast this for a while. Nothing, nothing inspiring, uh, nothing spectacular. Just simple obedience one day at a time. That's what the walk of faith is looking like in my life and maybe in many of yours. And you know, I read how the Israelites crossed the Jordan and I'm, I'm amazed, but more often I feel maybe more like Peter who took a couple of steps on the water and then started to fall. But I know that that same hand of Jesus is there to help me and it's there for you as well. So uh, moving on to some application for this principle of faith. And this is going to sound a bit redundant because, honestly, all these just come down to obedience. But uh, do what God is asking you to do, whether it's big or small, whether it's uh, understandable or ridiculous to you. Uh, like me, I'm sure none of you are actually facing a river that you have to cross, but to you, it may feel like that. It may be that daunting to you. But just like for Israel, each step of faith that you take will be worth it. You can't take that final step out of the river into the promised land and take, until you take the first step into the water. In order to get where God wants you to be, you have to obey what he's asking you to do here and now. You, uh, you maybe have a promise in the back of your mind that um, you know, sometimes it can be easy to try to formulate our own way of getting to the fulfillment um, but we have to obey him, the, the one who sees it all, the one who knows us completely. Some of the things God has asked of me this past summer honestly don't seem like they have anything to do with what I believe the ultimate things are that he's put on my heart, but I am trusting that each step is necessary, and I know that each step is an opportunity to grow. So take whatever step he's asking you to take. Uh, moving on, number four, we've looked at preparation, remembrance, faith. Number four is the principle of memorialization. It's a mouthful. If you're uh, struggling to spell that, just write the word memorial and then write the word ization. I honestly didn't know if that was a word until I typed it out and didn't get the red squiggly line under it, so I was like, all right. So we're still talking about our role in receiving the promises of God. He's made the promise, so what are we supposed to do? And as we go to the next chapter in Joshua, chapter 4, uh, we see God instruct them to do something uh, special. And we're going to read verses 4 through 7 in chapter 4. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every, every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in a time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. I don't know if this is done enough in the body of Christ today. And I'm not suggesting that we have stone monuments everywhere, but just this idea of memorializing what God has done. Are we doing our best to put to memory the things that he's done in our lives, both individually and corporately? Or are we so comfortable, so used to his goodness that we kind of take it for granted? These stones uh, for Israel were a sign. At every sight of them, people would say, oh yeah, remember what God did for us when he took us across the Jordan? And notice that it doesn't say if your children ask, it says when, because they would ask. This memorial stood out, apparently. So when uh, children asked about it, an opportunity came up for a more seasoned believer of God to share with them who God was and what he had done for them. And I want to draw 
a line real quick between this principle of memorialization and the one we talked about earlier, remembrance, because on the surface they kind of sound like the same thing. But in that second one we talked about remembering what God had said, keeping his promises before us. This goes a little bit further, remembering what God has specifically done for us, recounting not just his promises but his faithful follow-through in our lives because he has been faithful to each and every one of us. You may think, okay, but isn't that kind of like an Old Testament idea, you know, monuments and altars and memorials and appreciate you asking. No, it's not. So uh, proof of that can be found in uh, Paul's uh, account of Jesus setting up the memorial of communion. And we're not going to look at it this morning just for sake of time, but what he says in that as Jesus is setting up um, this memorial of communion, he says to do so in remembrance of him. So it's not just us um, coming together and hearing about what God has done, which is great as well, but it's, it's something physical that we're partaking of to remind us of what he's done for us. And it can be a teaching moment as well. You know, when our, when our children ask what we're doing, there's a great opportunity to tell them just what Jesus has done for us, right? It's easy to become familiar with these things, but as we participate in, in them, they serve not only as memorials to what God has done for us, but also as boosts to our faith. Reviewing what God has done for us propels us forward into what he can and will do for us. So, application for this principle of memorialization. This is my favorite. Uh, a couple of things here. The first thing I'll say is keep a journal. And you may be out there, David, I'm a man, I don't journal. I, I, I used to feel the same way. I used to think journaling was uh, feminine and emotional. And I have since found out that masculinity and emotional awareness actually pair quite nicely. So I journal. Um, I'm not afraid to say it. <laughs> Sometimes when we experience God moments throughout our lives, we think, man, I'll never forget that. We're so impacted that we just think, I'll remember that forever. And then time passes, and we forget. And Israel is a perfect example of this. They experienced miracle after miracle in the wilderness in Egypt, and then they turn around and complain to God, and they they magnify Egypt as this great place that they were in, completely forgetting what God had done for them. But Psalm 103, too, implores us to forget not all of his benefits, right? You remember the, the account in Exodus 17 where uh, Israel is fighting the Amalekites in the valley, and this is the battle. Joshua is actually leading the battle, but it's the one where as long as Moses' arms were raised, they were victorious, but if they were lowered they would experience defeat. Uh, I want to look at one verse from that chapter. It's Exodus 17, 14. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial and the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Write this for a memorial. Another version says, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered. Uh, the David International Version says, keep a journal. <laughs> this is, if, if you're one of those thinking, I'm a man, I don't journal, hey, his words, not mine. <laughs> this is something God clearly wants to do, wants us to do. Keep a record of the things he's done for you and review it. Uh, another potential application, this might look different for uh, different individuals, but I think visual reminders are very powerful. Um, I've got a couple of things in my house, really two of the only decorative things I have in my house at this point, that uh, have my favorite scripture on them. 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. Uh, it's just a reminder when I walk into those, those rooms, like, oh yeah, this is something that God has done for me, really the most important thing that God has done for me. He's loved me. And, uh, you know, it's great to keep a journal and review it, but you have to be pretty purposeful with that. Uh, most people don't keep their journals in the most visible and accessible places, so these visual things, I think, can be even more effective sometimes. Um, hang something on your wall that means something to you. Uh, put a post-it note in your car or in your, uh, on your mirror or on your fridge with something that God has said to you. Uh, 
one of my favorite Christmas gifts that I've ever received kind of falls into this category of memorialization. And uh, it's been several years, uh, but back in the day, uh, I did some songwriting. And one of the very first songs I wrote, Zach and I actually had a chance to record many years ago. And one of the repeated lines in the chorus is, I give my life to worship you, Lord. And the gift that I got through Zach's help and the creativity of my cousin Nicole was a plaque that had that line on it, and above the line was an image of the audio file of my singing of that line, which I was just like blown away by the creativity of that. But that hangs up in my music room at home, not as a, a memorial to, oh, I wrote a song, but as a memorial to why I'm here on this earth. It's a visual reminder. That's right, I'm here to worship my Lord and my God. There's all sorts of ways to be creative in this um, idea of memorialization. And if God prompts you to put a pile of rocks in your living room, go for it. But uh, for real, I do encourage you to take some time this week and just think of how you can do this in your own life, what this would be for you. And that brings us to the fifth and final principle in this message, which is the principle of confession. Um, sometimes, you know, we can be going along in our, our walks with the Lord, and we hit a bump on the road, and we get tempted by something and uh, take a step off of the path, right? This happened to Israel in Joshua chapter 7. They, uh, they had already crossed the Jordan. They had already defeated Jericho, again, which we uh, mentioned. And... Now they were headed to the next city that they were going to conquer, which was AI, which has nothing to do with artificial intelligence. Uh, or maybe it does. I don't know. <laughs> Joshua sent spies out to AI to see uh, what Israel would maybe need to do in order to overtake them. So spies went out. They came back with a confident report. They're like, yeah, Joshua, we don't, we don't need the whole army to take care of these people. We just need two or 3,000. Send them. They'll be able to take care of it. Joshua agrees, sends about 3,000, and instead of uh, defeating the people of Ai, they end up fleeing from them in fear, many of them losing their lives, and Joshua is distraught. Uh, I mean, think about it. Up to this point in his reign as Israel's leader, he's experienced a miraculous crossing of a river, a miraculous victory over Jericho, and now this. This kind of brings him down a little bit, and he starts to complain. And uh, really, he just throws a fit, like a lot like the others of his generation had done, who were all dead, by the way. He didn't learn. And he starts complaining to God. He's like, oh my gosh, you brought us, why'd you even bring us over the river into this land? And now the rest of the land of Canaan is going to hear about this. They're going to come defeat us. Then what, what are you going to do for your great name then? <laughs> and I love, I love the Lord's response to Joshua in, in Joshua 7.10. So the Lord said to Joshua, get up. <laughs> Sounds a lot like uh, something my mom said to me when I was having a meltdown as a kid. As a kid. I don't have meltdowns anymore because I journal. <laughs> In uh, God's response to Joshua's complaint, his gracious response, he reveals to him that there's sin in the camp. Uh, somebody had taken of the accursed things during their route of Jericho and uh, had hidden them, which is something God had strictly forbidden them to do. So he, he told Joshua how to deal with this. All the tribes would be brought out. They'd narrow it down to one and then narrow it down to a, a family, a household, until an individual was singled out. When they did this the next day, Achan from the tribe of Judah uh, was the guilty party who had stolen and hidden the accursed things in his tent. And once he was singled out, this was the exchange that we read in uh, Joshua chapter 7. We're going to read verses 19 and 20. Now Joshua said to Achan, my son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. And he goes on to detail uh, his sin. I want us to notice that confession here is considered by Joshua to be an act of worship. I I have read through Joshua I don't know how many times, and I've never really noticed this until recently, that confession can be an act of worship. 
He says, give glory to the Lord your God and make confession to him. And I think there's a couple of potential interpretations of this. Um, how, how is it that confession can give glory to God? First, uh, when we confess our sins, it brings us back into right standing, where we can, uh, again, be an accurate representation of God. And when we're accurately representing God, we're living the gospel, right, to those around us, which brings him glory. Also, uh, this word glory means weight. So when we sing songs that say, all the glory is yours, or you deserve the glory, we're saying, we're telling God that he holds the most weight in our lives and that he deserves to, right? Nothing holds weight compared to him. So the act of confession is quite literally a transfer of weight. It's us getting rid of that weight of sin, that burden, that conviction, and giving him glory in the process. Confession tips the scales back in God's direction as we say, God, forgive me for not honoring you in this area here. I want to get back on the right path and honor you. And in doing so, we give him glory. Now, uh, we are living in the New Testament era uh, where our confession is met with God's faithfulness to forgive, according to 1 John 1.9. Yeah. Pastor Scott just texted me asking how it's going, if you want to know. So let me just respond to that real quick. Just teasing. <laughs> Whenever we confess, God looks at the sacrifice that Jesus made and sees that it is still finished, right? He's still texting me. I'm going to put this on Do Not Disturb. <laughs> That was a mistake. So in the Old Testament, oh my gosh, how do I recover? All right, so as we are now in the New Testament, that's how our confession is dealt with, God seeing the sacrifice of Jesus, right? In the Old Testament, though, which is where we're at reading Joshua, whenever there was sin, there had to be death. And this was sometimes in the form of, you know, animal sacrifices or something else, but sometimes it was also the putting to death of the one who had sinned, which seems harsh, and you may ask, well, how could a, how could a loving God possibly do that? Hey, I'm a lay minister. You ask Pastor Scott that, so I don't get paid to do this. After, after Achan had confessed, um, Joshua still had to deal with him in the way that God had told him to, and uh, this is my one of my cousin Alex's favorite portions of scripture because it goes on to say that they took Achan and his things and put him in the valley and they stoned him with stones and burned him with fire. So they didn't stone him with something other than stones or burn him with something other than fire. They wanted to be very clear on that. But after all this goes down, after the sin is officially dealt with, the very next verse says this in Joshua 8, chapter 8, verse 1. It says, now the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid nor be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and arise. Go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. So once Israel's sin was confessed and dealt with, they got right back on the path that God had for them. And that same opportunity is available to us when we sin, when we confess our sin, right? Uh, the praise and worship team, you guys can... Uh, Make your way on back up here, if you would, please. So, what's the application for this principle of confession? Well, it's the easiest one we've looked at so far this morning. The application is confess. Confess. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and have fallen short of God's standard of righteous living. And sanctification is a process, right? It's something that begins when we are born again, and doesn't end until we see Jesus, according to Philippians 1. So it's a process that we'll be involved in for the rest of our lives. If you've been saved for 50 years, uh, you still fall short every now and then, right? We still have the world, the flesh, and the devil to contend with while we're here on earth. And God knew that we wouldn't live out these lives perfectly, so he set up this avenue of confession for us. Even uh, worldly organizations 
concede the fact that uh, admitting you have a problem is the first step to healing, right? I fall short all the time, but God never does. Let me read you one more verse out of the book of Joshua. It's towards the end, and this is during Joshua's final address to the people of Israel before he dies. It's in Joshua chapter 23. And it is verse 14 that I want to read. He says, Behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one word of them has failed. God is faithful even when we're not. So at the end of Joshua's life here, we see that Israel was now in the position where they were fully possessing everything that God had promised them. But it didn't come without endurance. It didn't come without faith. It didn't come without confession when necessary. Go ahead and stand up with me, uh, if you would. So in this moment, uh, I want to present an opportunity to actually apply this, this application of confession. The rest that we went over were kind of more take-home things that you can think about maybe today or the rest of this week. But I want to give us an opportunity to actually apply this one. Uh, my words this morning were not meant to convict because I don't have the power to do that. Uh, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit convicts the unbeliever of sin and the believer of righteousness. So if there's something that the Holy Spirit has used that I've said, um, and he's attempting to maybe shine some light on corners of your heart that you've maybe tried to keep hidden, it's probably a good indication that you need to confess something this morning. And if right now you're, you're thinking in your head, trying to talk yourself out of that, that's a better indication that you probably have something you need to confess this morning. So I want to present two opportunities to you this morning um, that may be for you, depending on what category you fall into. The first, um, to the one who has never uh, admitted that they have a problem, to the one who has never surrendered their position as little L, Lord of their life, to Jesus, who is the Lord of Lords, he is ready for you to give up that position. He died so that you could have this life that I've talked about this morning. Ephesians says, by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. So again, God, by his grace, has given us, made available this gift of salvation, and now it's your turn to use your faith to receive it. It's not a gift I can give you, uh, but if that's for you this morning, I would be honored to uh, lead you to the giver of that gift in prayer this morning. So if that's you, I'll start thinking. that intimidates you, find me after service. I would love to pray with you uh, in any context. Uh, just know that the Lord does require a public profession from you at some point. Uh, the second invitation to the one who is walking with the Lord but needs to make things right. Uh, you've taken a step off the path, and it doesn't have to look like uh, some rank sin that you've fallen into. It could just be, you know what, I, I love the Lord. Uh, I've been walking with him for however long, and but there's this one area that I've kind of kept from him. Um, and I'm not fully walking out the abundant life that he has provided. I'm not living the gospel I, the way I need to. I said earlier that in the Old Testament, whenever there was sin, there had to be death. Now, on this side uh, of the cross and the resurrection, Jesus was that final death sacrifice for us. Whenever we confess, again, according to 1 John 1, 9, God is faithful to forgive and put us back in that right standing. He hasn't left you, so don't leave him. So for, for those who need to respond in that, to that second invitation, as we sing, 
I just want us to take a couple of moments. This is something you can do from right, right where you're at uh, if you'd like to. But to a moment, I would encourage you to come down to the altars as well. I think that might cement this moment for you a little further even. And then you can go home and journal about it, right? So if you need to respond to either of those uh, invitations this morning, please do so. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for everything you've illuminated to us in your word this morning. We thank you for giving us Jesus. Thank you for the free gift of salvation. God, there's nothing we can do to earn it. You've even given us the faith necessary to receive it, Lord. We thank you for that. God, I just ask you to have your way in these last few moments of this service. Move on hearts, Lord. If anyone needs to respond, I just ask you to grant them the boldness to do so this morning. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.